It's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Wes Moore. Mr. Moore is a youth advocate, author, Army combat veteran, and social entrepreneur. He attended the Johns Hopkins University and subsequently came to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar to study international relations. After his studies, he served as a paratrooper and captain in the U United States Army, completing a combat tour of duty in Afghanistan. He then served as a White House Fellow to uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. His first book, The Other Westmore, became an instant New York Times bestseller and Wall Street Journal bestseller. He hosted Beyond Belief on the Oprah Winfrey net Network. He also founded an organization called STAND that works with Baltimore youths involved in the criminal justice system. Mr. Moore will be speaking, us, speaking to us today about defining our change in a world of change. Please join me in welcoming Wes Moore to the Global Scholar Symposium. Hey guys, good afternoon. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank y'all. Y'all are so sweet. Thank you very much. I really, I, I really appreciate that, and I'm incredibly humbled and uh, incredibly thankful to be here. Uh, and um, only beef I have is, uh, you know, when I, I'm looking specifically at, at Liz and, and Josh, or whoever set up the schedule, and asked me to come and speak after Professor Katz and the Dalai Lama, and uh, and uh, you know, whoever set that up, I appreciate that. Yeah. In the military, that's what we call an ambush. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but uh, but it, it, this is it's very cool for me to be here, and again, you know, just to be in a place that uh, not only just I had a lot of uh, you know formative times being back in the UK, um, but also to see that the, U the weather in the UK is much better now than it was when I remember it, um, and, and also kind of talk a little bit about this phase and this dynamic of of of, of social change, but within a more personal context. And what exactly is meant by that is this. So I remember I was speaking with Liz about this earlier and we were talking about, you know, what, what topic did you want to cover? And I was like, well, I would love to give my thoughts on, you know, education reform and I'd love to give my thoughts on, on criminal justice reformation and, and the political system and all these kind of stuff. And she looks at me, she's like, yeah, that sounds interesting and all. Um, but I think there's probably some other things that people might want to hear. And I'm like, like what? And she's like, well, like the fact that you're really only about eight to nine years removed from your time as being a, you know, a student at Oxford. And what that means and what that transition has been like for you. And it's fascinating because I know exactly the situation and the position that y'all are in right now, where every single day you're getting the same questions from people. The questions of, what are you studying? And then, what are you gonna do with that? And then what job do you want to have? And what, what's the title of the position that you're striving for with your life? And all these big, heavy, esoteric questions that they expect you to have an answer for. And eventually you get to the point that seriously you just start making up answers so people can stop asking you the question. <laughs> right? Where the, you just come up with some kind of, you know, a very glib response because the, the honest answer is you don't have an answer. And I guess my point is that's okay. You don't have to have this all figured out. You don't have to have the next 40 to 50 and 60 and whatever years mapped out in your life. In fact, I would argue that the ones who actually have that are the ones who might be missing some of the greatest blessings and opportunities that life has to offer. And so as you're going through this process and you're thinking about what title should I strive for, or what job should I strive for, or where is this major going to take me, I would argue that while those things are important, there's some much bigger, more important questions that you should probably be spending your time on. Questions like, what makes me useful? How can I be helpful? And who will I fight for? You answer those questions, you think about those questions, and I can guarantee you those will be much more worthwhile questions than sitting there and wondering about what title should I try to achieve. Because I'm going to be very honest with you. Well, there's a couple things I'll be very honest with you about. And again, this is with no disrespect to any professor or mentor or anything that's telling you anything different. Okay, if there's anybody in here like that, I'm not contradicting what you're saying. I'm simply trying to add on. <laughs> and the honest answer is this. There are a lot of people who have no titles whatsoever in this world that are doing absolutely amazing things. And there are some people who have really big titles who do absolutely nothing. 
The title means nothing. The title means what your business card says. The title means what, you, what the, the last line on your, on your resume block looks like. Title should never be your goal nor your aim. Impact should be your goal and your aim. And I'm be, another thing I'll be very honest with you, as you all are going through the process, and again, people are, are talking to you about, you know, what's your, what are you studying and how do you plan on applying that and all this kind of stuff, to be terribly, completely honest with you, no one ever anymore asks me, so Wes, what was your major? <laughs> Nobody. For those who are curious, it was international relations, and I enjoyed it. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> no one asks me anymore. No one ever asks me, hey, Wes, remember that class you took? You know, how'd you do in that class? Or, Wes, remember that test you, remember that paper you had to write on April 11th of 2001? How'd you do in that test? Nobody cares. All that stuff is purely ephemeral. Once you leave and once you finish, that information becomes, in many cases, irrelevant. Department, I have a friend in the Department of Labor, and he told me a stat that I, I told him I want to double check, but I don't think he's that far off, if not spot on. But do you know the percentage of people who are 35 and under who are actually working in what they focused on as their major? <laughs> they won't tell you, right? There's a, there's a reason, well, I'll, and I'll tell you not to, so for though, and maybe you all will fall into this number, and that's great, but for the people who are 35 and under who are actually working in their major right now, the number is 8%. 8%. So maybe this is the 8% right here. <laughs> and maybe this isn't. But either way, that's okay. Because the question of what are you gonna study, what are you gonna do, all that kind of stuff, those will all be there. And people are telling this out of love. People are telling you because they care about you, because they want you to make decisions that are right for you, because they want you to be happy, because they want you to be fulfilled. But my argument is going to be, you have to be the one to answer that question of what does fulfillment look like? Nobody else. That's gotta be your answer. People will give thoughts, people will give advice, people will give their honest critique. And it's fair, and you should internalize it, and you should listen to it. But the fact is, the answer of what you want to do with your life and the impact that you want to make with your life, it's within you right now. It's just simply waiting for you to unearth it. That's the question. Forget about that other stuff. Do well in school. Get good grades. All of you are here because you're crazy smart. But it's got to be about more than that. It's gotta also be about how do you find your own peace with what you do, and how do you make it mean something to people other than yourself? There's a, um, there's a I don't know if you, any of you uh, ever uh, read this book called Remembering Denny? Have you heard about it? So it's a book called Remembering Denny, and basically the book is about this guy whose, whose name was Denny. And uh, he graduated from Yale in, I believe it was like 1958 or something like that. And when he graduated, you know, Life Magazine, which was like the big magazine back then, but Life Magazine wrote this big piece about, you know, the, fi the 50 future leaders that we've got to watch. And Denny was right there profiled in it. He had this brilliant, beautiful smile. He was just announced as a Rhodes Scholar. He was going off to England. He was doing all this stuff. And everyone always said that Denny was going to be the President of the United States. No doubt in anyone's mind. And people literally, his friends, were calling him President Denny. They'd literally walk around and say, hey, Mr. President, hey, Mr. President, hey, POTUS, da 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 right? All this kind of stuff. And because that's what everyone expected of him. And that's what everyone thought Denny was going to be. He was that good. You fast forward about 35 years later, Denny is now a tenured professor at Georgetown University. His students love him. He enjoys what he's doing. He wasn't on the fast track of becoming the president. He was not the president yet, nor was he en route to become the president. But people appreciated him. But his friends never seemed to let go of the fact that somehow they found his life to be a failure because he wasn't the president of the United States, because he wasn't the senior senator from the state of blah, blah, blah. So somehow, they looked at this guy who was a tenured professor 
and looked at them and said that somehow he never lived up to the expectations that other people had of him, that other people had of him. When Danny was 56 years old, 56 years old Danny took his own life. And in many cases, and in, for many reasons, the weight that the expectations that other people had of him were so heavy that essentially his shoulders could no longer bear them. When you think about the impact that you want to make and the things that you want to do, make sure they're your own dreams. Make sure they're your own expectations. Because that is the true meaning of finding your fulfillment. Denny was extraordinary in every way and was fulfilling his life in the best way that he knew how. But for the other people around him, for the friends around him, for the people who ever since he was in his late teens and early 20s were telling him that you could do whatever you wanted and you, we, we expect you to be X and we expect you to be Y. And simply because he didn't do that, that somehow he was deemed as not being relevant. There's a, um, there's a, have you, any of y'all ever heard of Lauren Hill? Some of y'all, some old school people here, okay. All right, so Lauren Hill is a hip hop, hip hop art, hip hop and R&B artist, right? And so she put together this album, uh, I think it was back in 1998, it was called The Miseducation of Lauren Hill. It was a, it's a brilliant album, I mean like, I think she won like six Grammys and seriously, I think she was like, I think they were seriously making up awards to give her that year, because this album was so crazy, right? And, um, and she, the whole album is brilliant, but she had this one song, and I think it was it's track number 15 on the CD. I think it's the, the title track, but it's number 15, right? And in this song, she says something that I think is very appropriate. She says, and every time I tried to be what someone else thought of me, so caught up I wasn't able to achieve. But deep in my heart, the answer, it wasn't me. So I made up my mind to define my own destiny. I made up my mind to define my own destiny. All of you know inherently what your purpose is and what your passion is. Don't let the noise block that out. Don't let the noise get in the way of you being able to fulfill that. And the other thing that I also just wanted to talk about briefly is there was always gonna be this chatter and this talk about what title you should strive for and jobs and what would be the perfect pathway and all this kind of stuff. And again, while that stuff is important and you need to get a job, um, the most important question really does come down to who are you going to fight for? Who is going to benefit from your blessings? Who is gonna benefit from the fact that you have a lot of people who believe in you? and who are fighting for you, and quite honestly have been fighting for you, all of us, in ways that we never even expected, or in many cases, ways that at least for myself even deserved. Who becomes the beneficiary of that? I remember when, um, so the book that Liz was talking about, this book called The Other West Moore. I remember when uh, I was going through the process of, of, of going through publishing. And I know probably like three quarters of y'all are already published, right? But this was my first book. All right, and, uh, and I didn't know how the publishing game worked. I thought that, you know, so and basically the way the publishing game works is this. Everything you see on the inside of a book, all the words, the structures, all that kind of stuff, that's the author's intent. That's what the author wants to share with the world. Everything you see on the outside of a book, the cover, the title, the airbrushed author photos, all that kind of stuff, the blurbs, all that, that's the publisher. That's what the publisher wants to share with the world. And there's a reason for it. And it actually makes perfect marketing sense, right? The reason for it is, is that when a per the publisher knows that when a person walks into a bookstore, that they have got 3.2 seconds to capture your attention. When you walk into a store, 3.2 seconds to capture your attention. If I don't capture your attention in 3.2 seconds, you will just keep on walking and you will move on to the next book that captures your attention. So they will do whatever it takes in 3.2 seconds to capture your attention so that you will pick up the book, you will look at it and say, huh, that looks interesting. And you might even walk over to the cash register and buy it, right? That's their business model. So when they're having conversations with authors about what the title of a book should be or what the cover of a book should be, it's quite honestly more of a ceremonial conversation than anything else. They really don't care what you think. 
I didn't know that. I thought they cared about my opinion. So they called me in, and this is about probably about three months before the book, well, no, probably about four months before the book came out. And they didn't have a title yet, or at least they told me they didn't have a title yet. It was probably already on its way to printer, but they're like, Wes, what do you think the title of your book should be? I'm like, you know what, I'm glad y'all asked me. Because there's like six titles that I really like. And I'd like done focus groups with family and friends. Like I, I, I knew what the title should be. So I'm like, all right. And like, and they, so they look at me and they're like, all right, so what do, you, what do you think? And I'm like, all right, what about Baltimore Suns? Or what about All the Difference? Or what about Out of Many? Or what about End of the Innocence? Or what about, and I start rattling these titles off. And then I look at them and I say, so y'all can go ahead and choose between any of those six because I'm good with any of them. And they looked at me, they're like, that's very kind of you. Um, <laughs> and they said, they said but, we, but we think we have a better idea. And they said, what do you think about the other West Moore? And I said, that might be the dumbest book title that I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Truly, no, seriously, this is all true. I said, this is the dumbest book title I've ever heard in my life. And they're like, and they're like they almost look surprised. They're like, what, what don't you like about that? And I'm like, there's a whole bunch of stuff I don't like about that. But let me go ahead and start with three. <laughs> All right? First thing I told my like about it was that I try to make it very clear that the story is about much more than just these two kids. It's about much more than just one name or one socioeconomic group or one neighborhood or one race or one generation. It's about all of us. It's about the decisions that we make in our lives, but tantamount to that, the people who we have in our lives who help us to make those decisions. So by putting the name inside of the title of the book, you're completely negating that entire fact. Second thing I told mine like about it. What self-respected author do you know that puts their own name <laughs> inside of a title of a book? No, seriously, like, you know, the other J.K. Rowling, the other Stephen King, the other, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, seriously. And then the, th the third thing I told mine like about it, I was like, guys, no one knows who one Westmore is. <laughs> So why does anybody care who the other Westmore is? <laughs> right? I was like, you know, I don't even think my family would pick this thing up. And, so, and so, they, so they look at me and they smile and they're like, you know, those are actually all pretty good points. They said, the problem is that you're missing the point. Because you're absolutely right, it's not about you. And it's not about him. The name's completely irrelevant. You can throw any name inside of that book title. It really does not matter. Because the fact is, there are West Moors that exist in every one of our communities and in every one of our schools and in every one of our homes. Kids who every day are one decision away from going in one direction or going in a completely different direction. Kids who every day are straddling this line of greatness and the biggest problem is they don't even know it. The name's irrelevant. The name really doesn't matter. The most important thing about the title is the other. The fact that our society is full of others. People who do not look like us, who do not speak like us, who might live in the other part of town or in the other part of the world, but whose destiny matters as much to our long-term safety and security and greatness as ours does. The others. The people who every day, we all, and I say we all because I know I'm included in this, sometimes we can walk past and not think twice about the people who we can make very quick and glib and in many cases incorrect assumptions as to who they are and how they got there without, being, without having the own personal courage to be able to peel back the onion and understand a little bit and ask the simple question of why. Because why is complicated. Why is difficult. It's much easier to dismiss without asking that very complicated three-letter word. And so, as they explained what that process meant and why they thought this was the correct title, I reluctantly agreed. Because they're absolutely right. As we're thinking about this process of our lives and our careers, the name becomes increasingly irrelevant. The other is the thing that lasts. 
because we can never have an honest conversation about the future of our world if only a slither of the population is part of that conversation. We can never have an honest conversation, an honest conversation, about the future of our world if only a slither of the population is even being thought about in that conversation. That's not a true conversation. That's talking points. How do we do what we have to do to make sure that everybody has a seat at the larger table and that everybody's progress and growth matters? Because if we're not doing that, then what are we doing? And the way the story, and, and, and for those, for the 99.99999% of the people I was talking about who have no idea who Wes Moore is or what this, this story is about, I'll give you a, a very brief background and how it relates to exactly the point you're in right now. So basically, back in December 2000, the, the, uh, the Baltimore Sun, which is my hometown paper, I'm a, I'm a Baltimore guy, um, and they wrote this article about this local kid who just got this Rhodes Scholarship. And in this paper, they're talking a bit about what the Rhodes Scholarship is, and they talk a little bit about my background and my childhood. They spoke about the fact that, that I only have two memories of my father. And the second one was when I was about four years old and I watched him die. And how, as difficult as, as the transition I thought I had it, or my sisters had, I have an older sister and younger sister, the person who had the most difficult time with the transition was actually my mother. Because now here she was in her late 20s, she was now a widow with three children that she was going to raise on her own. And in no way was this the life that she had expected or the life that she had prepared for. And she moved us up to New York, up to the South Bronx to go live with my grandparents. And my grandmother is from Cuba and was a public school teacher in the South Bronx for 27 years. My grandfather is from Jamaica and was a minister in the South Bronx. And their house was barely big enough for them, but somehow they figured out a way to make it big enough for all the kids. And I found that very quickly as I moved up to the Bronx, I found myself getting very lost. Where you're trying to find this definition of manhood from a whole bunch of people who quite honestly have no business teaching you anything. Where you find yourself um, hurting people that really love you so you can impress people that could care less about you. And by the time I was eight and nine, I started picking and choosing which days were worthwhile to go to school. By the time I was 10 and I was on probation and kicked out of one school, by the time I was 11, was the first time that I felt handcuffs on my wrists at 11 years old. And uh, by the time I was 13, I found out that when my mom makes threats, that she's not playing. Because she'd been threatening this idea of military school ever since I was eight. Like, if you don't get this together, I'm gonna send you to military school. And I looked at her and I'm like, mommy, I can see you're upset. I'm gonna work harder. And then when I was nine, she started giving me brochures to show me she wasn't playing around. So I'd look at the brochures, I'm like, all right, mommy, I can see you're upset. I'll work harder. And the threats kept coming. My behavior kept getting worse. And finally, when I was 13, she came up to me and she was like, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm staying in military school. And I looked at her and I said, mommy, I can see how mad I'm making you. And uh, I'm gonna work harder. And she's like, nah, you're going next week. And she, uh, <laughs> I'm glad y'all found that funny. <laughs> And, uh, and she packed her stuff up, and even when we loaded up the car, I honestly thought that we would just drive around the block a few times. Um, problem was, she kept on driving. And she drove to the school, which, and, and to be very honest, I hated everything about this school when we first showed up. Um, I ran away five times in the first four days. They had these big black gates that surrounded the school, and every time they turned their back, I would just run out of the gates, because they kept on talking about there's this train station in Wayne. So I would just run to try to find the train station. I kept getting lost. Finally, one time, they actually gave me a map on how to get to the train station because it was so pathetic that I kept on getting lost. <laughs> um, and I got lost again. Um, but eventually, after the, the second to last time I ran away, they found me in the middle of the woods at 1.30 in the morning. And I was literally sitting there crying. Because first of all, I'm crying because I'm scared because I'm in the middle of the woods and I'm a city guy. I mean, I know, I know big buildings and lights and barking dogs and I don't know the woods. I don't know the trees and the forest. I mean, the only thing I know about them seriously at that point in my life was in horror movies, that's where folks go and do not come out of. So I'm freaking out. They found me in the middle of the woods. They brought me back to campus and they said, uh, you're allowed to make one phone call. Call whoever you want, but you've got five minutes. And I called the only number that I knew, which is mom. So mom won't expect to hear from me for 
eight weeks and now her hitter's on day four, one o'clock in the morning, she gets a phone call, so she's freaking out. I'm like, mommy, I'm okay. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity, but I'm really ready to come home. Um, <laughs> I'll do better, I'll clean, I'll go to school more often, I'll clean my room, your room, I'll do whatever. And I started going through this whole litany of things that she needed to do to make my life easier. Uh, and then she stopped me. And she said, too many people have sacrificed in order for you to be there. And too many people are rooting for you. And you've got to understand it's not all about you. And I listened to her talk for five more minutes and after five minutes they said my time was up. I gave them back the phone, they hung up the phone, they sent me back up to my room. And I'd be lying if I said anything changed that night because it didn't. I woke up the next morning even angrier than I did the night before. But eventually I began to understand what she was talking about. The fact that the only way that I was gonna make it through this thing was if my friends and my peers were there to push me. And the only way that they were gonna make it was if I was there to push them. By the end of that first mandatory year, I, uh, I was doing a little better academically and I could play sports because I wasn't on probation anymore. And for the first time in my life, I felt like when people asked my mom, how's Wes doing? She could say he's doing okay and not be lying. We eventually moved back down to Baltimore. I said, if it's okay, I'd like to sit tight. My mom sacrificed a whole lot that I didn't even understand at the point to make it work. But the thing that I realized wasn't the fact that I, it wasn't the fact that I was physically transported. Moving from Baltimore to the Bronx to military school or whatever, that didn't change my way of thinking. What changed was that I found myself surrounded by people. Starting with my mom and my grandparents, but eventually leading to this ridiculously amazing string of role models and mentors and friends, people who were like in this room, I know with Bob and Dawn and Mary, I mean people, people who helped me to understand that the world is much bigger than what's directly in front of me. People who helped me to understand that this is a big and a beautiful and a wide world and that I actually had a place in it. Who helped me to understand that there wasn't going to be a single accident of birth, not being black, not being poor, not being from Baltimore or the Bronx or fatherless that was ever going to define me or that was ever going to limit me. And so in essence what they did was they taught me what it meant to be free. By the time I actually finished up high school, I joined the Army right out of high school, I went to community college. After community college, I went on to Johns Hopkins University, and while I was a senior at Johns Hopkins was when the Baltimore Sun is writing this article about this local kid who just got this Rhodes Scholarship. And the same time, they're writing a whole series of articles about four guys who one day walked into a jewelry store. And the first two guys walked in the jewelry store. When they walked in the store, they reached in their coats and they pulled out guns. And they cocked the guns back and they started pointing the guns at everybody inside the store and telling everybody to get on the ground and keep your hands on top of your heads. And everybody who was inside the store got on the ground, put their hands on their heads like they were told to. And then 10 seconds later, two other guys walked in the jewelry store and they walked in the, when they walked in the store, they reached in their coats and they pulled out mallets. One guy with a gun, one guy with a mallet went to the left. One guy with a gun, one guy with a mallet went to the right. The ones with the guns were keeping everybody on the ground while the ones with the mallets were walking around and smashing out jewelry cases and taking out watches and rings and necklaces. All four met in the back of the store. They had a little over $400,000 worth of jewelry. One of them yelled, let's go. And then all four then ran out of the center of the store and ran outside to the adjacent parking lot. One of the people that was inside the store that day was an off-duty police officer who was moonlighting as a security guard. He was a 13-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Force. He was a three-time recipient of Police Officer of the Year. He was also a father of five who just had triplets. And the reason he was working that day was because it was his day off from the police force and he took on a second job as a security guard to make extra money for his family. And he got up off the ground and he drew his weapon and he ran outside to see if he could stop the guys from getting away. And when he ran outside, he started kneeling next to cars and vehicles to give himself cover. And he didn't realize that one of the cars that he was kneeling next to was one of the cars that the guys were in. And they rolled the window down and they shot him three times at point blank range and they killed him instantly. And there was a 12 day national manhunt for these four guys and finally after 12 days, all four guys were caught. And we found out that when all four guys were caught, that one of the people that the police were looking for, that was eventually captured and tried and convicted and sentenced, was also named Wes Moore. And the more I learned about this crime and this tragedy, the more I learned how much more we had in common than just our names. 
the fact that we were living in the same neighborhood, literally blocks away from each other, both grew up in single parent households, both had academic and disciplinary troubles, both were around the same age, and I knew there were questions I wanted to ask, and I knew Wes was the only one that could answer them. So one day, I just decided to write him a note. And literally, the first note that I wrote him was like, you know, hey, Wes, my name is Wes. Here's how I heard about you. And I had a whole list of questions. And then I wasn't expecting to hear back from him. And then about a month later, I receive a letter back from Jessup Correctional Institution from Westmore. And it'd be one thing if the letter I would have gotten back from Wes, like it was like he wrote it in crayon or magic marker, or wrote it with his whole hand, or you know, it didn't make any sense, or instead of using words, he used pictures. Because if that's the letter I would have gotten back from, I would have looked at that letter and said, you know what, I guess this kind of makes sense then. The problem is I've never received that letter from him. The problem is the letter that I did receive from him was one of the most interesting and articulate letters that I've ever received in my life. And it only led to more questions. And that one letter turned into dozens of letters, those dozens of letters turned into dozens of visits, and now I have known Wes for close to a decade. And so we think about what that means, and I know a lot of times people will say to me, they're like, you know, I don't know, you know, so what was the one thing? What was the one thing that makes one kid go one way or one kid go another way? And the fact is I tell them, listen, there is no one thing. Raising kids is amazingly complicated, and when you happen to raise children in some of the most dangerous and precarious parts of our world, it is that much more complicated. I will debate with anyone who tells me that every child is born with the same amount of assets because there are places around this globe that I would love to take you to and hear you make that same argument. I'm a firm believer that potential in this world is universal. Opportunity is not. And the difference between potential and where we end up is where we all come in. That's where we all come in. The people who choose to pay attention and not to be apathetic. The people who choose to make their life mean something more than simply a job title. But to make to that, that actually means something. We can talk about a whole series of things that matter. We can talk about education, we can talk about faith, we can talk about family, we can talk about foundations, we can talk about structural issues. And all these things are right and important and real. But there's also something that I know is incredibly important, and then I'll close up on this. Is that expectations matter too. I remember once when I was speaking with Wes about Baltimore, and I'd always come up with this idea, and, and y'all might have heard this expression, I don't know if y'all heard the expression, that we're products of our environments. And we're products of our environments. I, remember telling, I, always, I came up with that, like it was so common that I just thought that that had to be facts. We're products of our environments. And I remember I once asked Wes about it. And we were talking about West Baltimore, and I said, do you think that we're products of our environments? And Wes looked at me and he said, actually, I think we're products of our expectations. And I thought to myself, he is absolutely right. In 29 years, everything that I thought was shattered in a sentence. That we're not products of our environments, we're products of our expectations. The important thing to remember about expectations, though, is this. People's expectations of themselves are not born from nowhere. The expectations that people have of themselves are born from the expectations that other people have of them. And they just simply rise to them, or they fall to them. So if we will look at an individual or the community that they come from, or the, or the part of the world that they come from, and we say to ourselves, then they'll probably just fine. Then they put all the tools in place to make that happen, and they'll go on, and they'll finish primary school, they'll finish secondary, they'll go on and become successful fathers and husbands and mothers and wives, and do wonderful things with their life, and we put that in their life, then that's generally what kids will do. And if we look at a kid, or where they come from, and we say they're probably not gonna make it. They'll probably be involved in the juvenile justice system, they'll get older, become part of the adult prison system, and we let that be the lingering theme. Then kids have a funny way of making that happen as well. As we think about what you wanna do, and as you're getting all these people who are asking you every single day what you study, that stuff's important. The degree that you get will be great. It'll look beautiful in the frame 
that you buy for it after it's done. But never forget why you're here in the first place. Never forget about what the real meaning of higher education is, because we have a whole lot of people who have a whole lot of letters after their name, but you can make a very real argument about how truly higher educated they really are. When you think about this process that you're going through now, understand that all the awards and the accolades and the accomplishments and the bios and everything like that, that stuff begins to fade pretty quick. A bio is not a story. Don't spend time worrying about what your bio is going to be. Spend time worrying about what your story is going to be. Because that's going to have a much greater and a much more lasting impact than anything else that you'll focus on. I'm, uh, I'm incredibly proud of what y'all are doing and humbled on such a beautiful April day that we spent some time together. So thank y'all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was phenomenal. That was phenomenal. Um, does anyone have any questions to ask Westmore? Yes, questions. Sorry. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Kurt Burning. I'm Thank studying you. at the University of East Anglia. I loved your talk, and I'm a big Lauren Hill fan. So great. Thanks for mentioning. Yes. That. Um, I think. Sorry. <laughs> One of the most interesting things you mentioned was universities are basically not real places. I mean, I think what you were talking about was they're so disassociated, they're so divided from real life that we're not gaining what we should. I mean, I'm a master's student. If I didn't work in a pub one night a week, yeah. all I would talk to for the last seven months would be other master's students. <laughs> And that's a huge problem, you know? I think that's a giant problem. So how do we take universities and make them more real? Can we, or do you have to leave to get that experience? Great question. Um, I, I'm gonna be very honest with you. I think universities have a very big problem. Uh, and, and I think they, they, they've got very big problems on a collection of different levels. First of all, first of all it's, they have a pricing model challenge where we cannot continue to have the cost of universities continue doing this while real income continues doing this. It's just not going to work. Uh, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give, an, give an example. I mean, you know, Johns Hopkins University, where I graduated from, the, over this next year is going to be approximately $66,000. Who's going there? Right? I mean, you're going to have something where you're, gonna, you're basically going to have either for the very wealthy where that does not become an issue, or the very poor where everything is subsidized, and everything in the middle eventually just gets squeezed. So I think higher education as a whole has a real problem that they need to think about, and it's a real pricing model that they need to think about, because also what that means is when you have challenges of a pricing model, then you are inherently going to have challenges with your student body model. Because if you really want to look at having a representative student body, it's very difficult from jump to have a representative student body when already the pricing dynamic has already priced out a large share of the people who could then make that university a, a much broader experience. The second thing, and, and another thing I think going back directly to the question is, the most successful universities are universities that understand that they are not in a community, but that they are of a community. And we have a far too many universities that simply say the way that we deal with the communities that we live in is essentially by buying everything up and just expanding the footprint of the university without understanding the inherent joys and the inherent history that lies within the communities that they call home. So I think some of the best things that universities can do is actually to make sure that there is a genuine outreach and that there's a genuine communication because also the challenge is, is that I think for a lot of times even when you see universities who say we're trying to help our communities and we're going to take over this piece of property, take over this, all that kind of thing, the next natural question becomes well how many people of the community were actually part of that conversation and part of that, part of that, you know, that, the, the master plan? And in many cases the answer is none. And you can't talk about helping people if they are only subjects of the conversation 
and not part of the conversation. Because if that's the case, then a whole lot gets lost in translation. The thing that I think universities can best do to help address this is universities are going to do what universities are going to do. You can have enlightened leadership at universities that can help try to push the needle and help try to push the, push the fabric. But the fact is, the people who truly make a larger character of a university are the students that call it home. They're the students who actually have real involvement in what's happening within a community, what's happening within a world. You know, I, I've, I've spoken to people where I said, I find it fascinating that people can get degrees in international relations and don't own a passport. How does that make sense? How people can get a, get a degree in, in, in urban policy and management and they spent their entire four years on the campus. So you're reading books about it? I mean, congratulations, but what do you really know? So I think it really, it, it's, it's both on the university leadership, but then on the student body to be able to go out and make that impact known. I'm, you know, quite honestly, I think about my time at Johns Hopkins, um, and I had a great experience there, and it was fun, and it was interesting. Um, a lot of the stuff there I, that I learned, I completely forgot. Uh, but I think one of the best things that I had, one of the best experiences that I had there, and the thing I always lean back on, was the organization uh, that Liz was talking about, was about Stand where we, we created an organization that works with kids involved in the juvenile justice system in Baltimore City. The reason we did it because, wasn't because we were trying to start an organization, it was because, because I took a class in college called Criminal Justice and Correction. For the class, I had to do an internship. And I knew because of my background, I wanted to work with kids. And so I was looking around trying to figure out who's working with kids, and I realized that they had no organizations that worked with kids specifically who were involved in the juvenile justice system. In fact, some organizations like the PAL, the Police Athletic League, once a kid gets involved in the juvenile justice system, they're no longer allowed to participate in PAL. And I'm thinking to myself, these are the kids that need you the most. If you don't want to work with them now, Police Athletic League, you'll see them again, Police <laughs> Athletic League. So, so, so basically, it's myself and a bunch of other you know, naive football players, three of us, three other guys, we decided, well, then let's create something. And naively, we thought we could do something that could be useful. 10 years later, the organization is still around and is still serving hundreds of kids in Baltimore City, helping to mentor, befriend them, and tutor them, and get them back along a track and teaching them that your past mistakes do not have to be your future destinies. It becomes, <laughs> it becomes part of the student body, and it behooves the student body to make that university outreach something real. Because I agree, we have far too many people who sit in towers and, and pontificate about the challenges and have no idea what they're talking about because they're not out there actually experiencing or doing it themselves. Oh, sorry. Let me come this way. Sorry. I'll, I'll let you pick. I'll let you pick. Please, go ahead. I don't get in trouble. Hi, um, I'm Hailiki. I'm doing Hi, uh, gender studies here at Cambridge. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, yes, it was such a fantastic talk, so thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, whether you have an opinion, I'm sure you do, on the observed gender disparity in uh, criminal offending rates and prison populations. I mean, uh, you mentioned kind of learning about masculinity from possibly the wrong people. I was wondering if, if you think that it's about uh, norms about masculinity that's the problem or if it's something else. Great question. Um, I can now I, I can speak about what I know about the work within within the U.S. Um, you know, so so I'm, I'm not sure exactly if these trends hold true on a global context, but I know they hold true in the U.S. The fascinating thing about the prison population, particularly the juvenile to prison pipeline, there's a couple of things to remember and a couple of stats that I'll throw out. Even though I'm not a I'm not a stat junkie like that because I think stats in many cases are used to actually dissuade and push people away from truth. But here are some stats that exists within the U.S. criminal justice system. 66% of people in the U.S. prison population had some form of run-in with the juvenile justice system. So basically what you have is now kids who've essentially were involved in the juvenile justice system who've now just gotten older and are committing more serious crimes, right? Another stat that is another, another true reality. 69% of people involved in the criminal justice system within the United States are there for nonviolent offenses. So mainly what we're talking about is a whole list of things, but quite honestly, it comes down to one word, drugs. 
of people in the US prison population. When we think about those kind of dynamics and also the gender breakdowns and what that means, ironically, the fastest growing population of people incarcerated in the, in the United States right now are African American women. Now, there's a couple big dynamics and a couple big reasons for that. Part of it is because you're starting to see much more involvement with, with, you know, with women, particularly, you know, particularly women of color in drug trade and where that stuff kind of gets built up. A lot of it also comes down to where you have situations where a girl will sit there and defend her boyfriend and or spouse or something like that. And then, quite honestly, the sentences for them are even much longer than it is for the person who's actually you know, perpetrating the crime. But I think also when you look at those dynamics, what happens is it's the way we think about how we're raising girls and how we're raising boys. And I actually think, of this, and this, this is where I think it becomes a global dynamic, I think we have a real problem in the way how we think about raising boys inside of our society. Because I think we have actually, and when you're looking at all the trends of things like college acceptance rates, college admittance rates, PhD programs, et cetera, women are cleaning men's clocks right now. They are. Women are cleaning men's clocks. And I think pro the problem is and the challenge is, is that the way how we think about we're raising young boys and what it means to be, go through this process of manhood is not syncing with 21st century thinking. And I think we continue to find ourselves getting caught in this backwards paradigm. My mother, is, my mother will, will tell you that she raised myself and my sisters differently. She thought that there were certain things that I had to do for him that I did not have to do for them. She thought there were certain leeways that I could give him about you know, what he did and how he's hanging out or if he spent too much time telling him, get outside and go play and go get roughed up and da 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 But with my girls, she was you know, having them focus, having on her daughters, doing much more things to focus on things that what she didn't realize was actually much better preparing them for the 21st century than she was preparing me for the 21st century. We need to do a much better job of being able to think about how exactly are we preparing young boys to become men. Because the transitions and the trends that we are seeing, particularly amongst young boys and particularly amongst young boys of color, are disturbing to say the least. Where essentially you're almost preparing and perpetuating this permanent underclass. Unless we can do a whole lot more to address that type of dynamic. So while I do think there are challenges, and I think we are seeing some trends where you're saying, again, where you're having more girls involved in, in, in criminal justice system, more girls involved in the juvenile justice system, et cetera. Um, what we're seeing with the boys is off the charts. And I think we have to have a much clearer focus about what that means and also what the long-term dynamics that are gonna look like. Thank you. Hi. Hello. Uh, Hi. Sorry, Tim, anyway. Hello, yeah. I'm Abhishek. Uh, Abhishek. I'm uh, a student here at Cambridge. I'm a shaping scholar. Thank, Thank you for an amazingly interesting talk. Great. Congratulations. Quite inspirational as well. Thank you. Uh, I just want to ask uh, regarding your point on uh, whether expectations makes what we are or whether environment makes what we are. Because I believe that environment actually uh, shapes the expectation from which other people have on us yep. as well as our own expectation from us. So how those two things are related, and from this point onwards, like how to actually provide those opportunities to the potential which is not get, getting this environment to shaping their expectation and then coming forward. Thank you. Both great points, both great questions. Um, and, and, I, and I agree with you, because I, 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 don't, I think part of the challenge is that when people put all the weight on one or the other, what they're essentially doing is they're pushing all responsibility off themselves. Uh, so when someone says it's all about the environment that someone's raised in or it's all about a person's personal, you know, what they're essentially doing is they're saying that then it's basically up to that individual to help figure it out and it means that I don't have any real say or any real, any real potency in terms of addressing their situation. It's interesting because um, last summer, uh, y'all know who Nick Kristoff is? So Nick Kristoff, he's an op-ed writer for the New York Times, uh, liberal. And he, I got an email from him basically saying, he's like, I, I read your book and I want you to let you know I really enjoyed it. I want to write an op-ed about it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's great. Thank you. And then so that Monday he writes this op-ed, uh, you know, really beautiful op-ed basically saying, I really enjoyed this book because I thought it was a great examination of race and class and, and, and divide in our society. Three weeks later, I get an email from the publisher saying that, listen, Michael Gerson wants to write an op-ed, wants to write an op-ed about your book. Michael Gerson is a conservative. 
Former speechwriter for President Bush, writes for the Washington Post. He writes this really beautiful op-ed based saying, I really enjoyed this book because I thought it was a great examination of personal responsibility and individual, and individual potency. <laughs> These are two people who agree on nothing, right? Um, but it was both saying they enjoyed it, but for completely different reasons. And so when I was talking to my wife about it, she said, so what do you think? Who's right? And I said, well, I said, I guess both of them are right. Going back to your point, is that we can't talk about societal responsibility without understanding, but these are also individual decisions. And I still believe that one of the greatest gifts that God gave us is this idea that we have personal choice. And at the end of the day, our choices become very personal choices. However, you cannot talk about personal choice without understanding that all these choices are being made in a societal context. And all these things are being made with a complete understanding of the environment that surrounds them. And you know, and I, I always, you know, I'll, you know we, we still, again, we do work with kids in the juvenile justice in Baltimore, and I always find it fascinating when I hear people tell me, man, you know, I just wish they would make decisions that would be better for their best interests, or better for their long-term futures. And I think to myself, when you're being raised on, on Dolphin Street, and your father is serving a life plus 20 term, and your mother is a heroin addict, and your older sister continues to get sexually transmitted diseases because your mother continues to push her out and prostitute her so she can make money for the family, talk to me about what a responsible choice looks like. In many cases, what they're doing is absolutely rational. So how do we change rational thinking? How do we change what's rational? Because I can make a very good argument that what that kid is doing when he's out there hustling is very rational considering his circumstances. So the way we have to think about that and think about changing rationalities, because fact is, you know, we, we have to look at changing environments, we have to look at, at, at uplifting communities, we have to look at involving parents and guardians and all that kind of stuff, and all that has to be done. But there also has to be a sense of urgency of the what ifs. What if we cannot do that on a, on a, on a small enough time scale? And we can't just simply write people off. So it means, how do we get more people engaged and involved in communities that not, might not be their own? How do we help people understand the people, the people who we're looking to, to, to serve and the people that we're looking to help, that the world is much bigger than just what's right there? And quite honestly, the argument that I think we have to make to people, for the people who think can be very helpful in this, and this is, I'm both talking about individual small communities like a Baltimore, or I'm talking about on a global scale, or I'm talking about on a, on a specific issue, is let them know why this matters to them. Let them know why you doing this work, even if you don't want to do this work to be selfless, do the work to be selfish. Do the work because you know that for you and your kids or whoever else, that if we live in a, state, in a safer community, and we live in a community that actually has real opportunity for other people, you're actually doing the most selfish thing that you can possibly do. Because it means that your children and your family is going to grow up in a place that actually has more hope and prosperity for all people. Even if you don't want to do it because you want to be the Dalai Lama. <laughs> do it because you are so selfish that you're like, I want my family and my kids to come up in, safe, in a safe world. If that's your motivation, I could care less what your motivation is. Just do something. Make people see why this is in their best interest. And I would argue that the best way you're going to be able to do that is by continuing to remind them of the stories. When, um, and I'll be very quick, I'm sorry, but like when I remember when I was first going through the process of this book, um, we, uh, my first thought was to do like a 10-step prescriptive guide. Like what are the 10 steps that every mentor or parent should do to help out their child and da da da, right? And my publisher actually went up to me, he's like, you know, that sounds really interesting, Wes, but I'm going to be very honest with you. No one wants to read a parenting book by a 30 year old with no children. <laughs> and I was like, true, true. <laughs> and, he was, and he said, he said, uh, he said, tell the stories. Tell the stories. They will understand what you're trying to say without feeling like you're trying to beat them over the head with it. 
And so I think the way that we can best make people feel that they have a real vested interest in the success of communities other than their own is never let them forget who we're talking about. These are not numbers, these are not stats. And this is why I said why well, I have a very mixed feeling about stats. It's very easy to hide behind stats. It's very easy to get your eyes glossed over. Remind people of who we're talking about. And it's amazing how that human, that collective sense of humanity will sometimes kick in. Um, Wes, thank you so much for um, speaking today. I am actually so proud that um, I'm also a community college transfer and yeah. I actually went to Stanford, so props to you. I feel very, a lot of pride for that. Thank you. Um, and I've noticed that from, um, actually my name is Tenzin and I'm a Rhodes Scholar um, this year at Oxford. Congratulations. So, uh, Congratulations. Thank you. And so my question is that, you know, I went from community college to Stanford and then to Oxford, and I'm noticing that I'm having a lot of inner turmoil um, with regards to reconciling with the fact that I, that I and many of us in here will become leaders of our community, but how many will actually become members of our community? And mm. I'm feeling that the more we go up in these mm. social classes and in these prestigious universities, the less connected we become to the community that we actually fought for, the community that we stood behind. So how do you do it? And what would you recommend for people like us who want to go on that path like you do and remain connected and, and real? Oh. Yo, this room is crazy. <laughs> Y'all are really smart people, man. Um, it's a great, great question. Um, so in terms of, of, of a little background, I, um, once I finished up at Oxford, my, my path is, I, I would not recommend my path to anybody because it's, it's so circuitous and doesn't make any sense. Um, I finished up at Oxford. I started working in finance. I worked in finance for two years. Then I said, I don't like that. And then I went back into the Army because I enlisted in the Army when I was 17. Went back in, joined up with the 82nd Airborne, trained up with the 82nd. We deployed twice to Afghanistan. Um, after I finished that up, I did the White House Fellowship. After the White House Fellowship, I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. And so I went back to finance. Made a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> I was working in New York for, for five years in finance and then uh, eventually decided that, uh, that this wasn't who I am and that I wanted somebody else. And again, I'm not saying this to, to, for anyone who here is planning on being you know, the next chairman of J.P. Morgan or whatever like that. I think that's great. Um, it just wasn't for me. Right? Uh, and then about eight months ago, my wife and my daughter and I, we actually moved back to Baltimore. And uh, you know the businesses that I was running up in New York and the work we were doing up in New York, I have simply then just moved everything back down with me to Baltimore. Uh, and a big reason for that was because I never felt like I was at home living in New York in the same way that I felt like I'm at home now living in Baltimore. Um, I say that to say, as you're going through this process, your community will always be proud of you for what you've done, for what you accomplished, because you're one of them. And it is a real priority to make sure that you are always proud of it, that you have that same sense of pride about where you came from, to wear that on your sleeve everywhere you go. It's challenging because you are going to get some unbelievably crazy, ridiculous offers to do unbelievable, crazy, ridiculous things. Your intelligence, your intelligence warrants that. Your intelligence justifies that. And the fact is, these are things that you should take very, very seriously. But as you're going through and thinking about what is it that you want to do, what is the impact that you want to make, I would say also never forget about what made you so attractive, smart, talented. It was your hard work. But it was also about the fact that you had a community of folks. When I say community, what could be family, someone could be friends, someone could be mentors, or someone really could literally be a community that's still, even to this day, helping to lift you up. That's still, to this day, helping to elevate you. 
helping you to see over all this stuff. Your relevance to them still matters. Its relevance to you should also still matter. Because I think one of the most damaging things that we have is that we have a lot of people who might have not come from the best circumstances who then end up no longer being in those circumstances and who have somehow completely forgotten about those circumstances. They argue this whole, uh, you know, the whole pull myself up from my bootstraps argument, which I think is the most absurd and ridiculous argument I've ever heard in my life. Um, and I can give a whole collection of reasons why. But um, it's not that people aren't working hard, but it is about the fact that there are people who are also working hard on your behalf, for your behalf, who you might not even know right now. It becomes incredibly important that your blessings can actually mean something, actually do something for that community that you called home before. Because that, in many cases, become true legacies. You will always be pulled and called to do these amazing jobs and amazing things. Um, but you should also let it be known where you came from and who you continue to serve. Because that, in my opinion, is also what makes you incredibly attractive. I had a, a mentor who said something to me once when I told him I wanted to go back into finance. He hated the idea. He was like, that's dumb. You shouldn't be doing that. You should do X, Y, and Z. And I explained him why. And I told him I need some money and da, 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 da. And he's like, listen, I get it. If you feel like you have to do it, it's fine. Um, and then he said something which I, I, I would impart on you, which I thought was brilliant advice. He said, do it while as long as you think you have to do it. And then the moment you feel like you can do what it is that your heart is telling you to do, leave and do it. Because for every day you stay doing something along those lines and forgetting about where you came from and the communities that boosted you up, you become extraordinarily ordinary. And for all the high achievers in this room, there is nothing more damning than being extraordinarily ordinary. Uh, we have time for one more question. Um, did you have a question? This is Perfect talk, thank you. Thank um, you. Since you're from Baltimore, I'm wondering if you uh, could share any thoughts on what you think of The Wire. Um, <laughs> do you have any, um, I mean really, yeah. uh, do you have any criticisms of the way it portrays your city and its people? Great question. Um, so is, is everybody here familiar with The Wire? Is there anyone who's not familiar with The Wire? Okay, so for, for, the, for the hands up, The Wire is a, uh, is a, a, a it actually never won an Emmy, even though it should have. Um, but it's a you know, highly acclaimed series that was on HBO. And basically what The Wire was, it was a story of Baltimore. And make it about just American cities as a whole, but it used Baltimore as its backdrop. And really what it was, it broke the challenges of the city down into different seasons. So the first season was kind of the introduction to the drug trade. And the reason they came up with the name The Wire was because how the police were trying to keep track of drug dealers while continuing to tap wires into their phones. And how the drug dealers always just happened to be one step ahead of the police. You know, sounds familiar, right? Um, the second season was about the ports because Baltimore, uh, for those who know, is a port city. And, and a huge part of Baltimore's industry, at least formerly, was the ports. Uh, you know, the fact that there's a huge docking station, everything like that, and basically how, you know, these communities are being flooded with drugs. It's not because people are cooking the drugs in their basement alone. They're being brought in from elsewhere. And so, the se so season two really dealt with how exactly all this trafficking is taking place in American cities and why you're seeing cities that are over flooded with things like heroin, cocaine, eventually crack cocaine, et cetera. Third season was about the political system, uh, and it looked at how urban and municipal politics uh, and those dynamics can sometimes get corrupting and corrupted within that whole system. Fourth season was about the schools and what it did was it brilliantly followed these four kids from Baltimore City and showed the challenges that the average kids in Baltimore City faces and which ones do well, which ones don't. And the fifth season was about the press and the press role in either exposing or suppressing things that are happening. I personally thought The Wire was not just brilliant television because it was just brilliantly well done. I also thought it was brilliant because David Simon, while being a great filmmaker, really what David Simon is, he's just a great journalist. Everything in The Wire, if you look at it, 
is real. All the characters are based on real people. If you look at you know, the character that they have for Carcetti, he literally based that character off of the current governor of Maryland, who was the former mayor of Baltimore City. If you look at the city council president, he literally based it on the city council president that was indicted four years ago during season three of The Wire. If you literally, if you look at people like, you know, Omar Little, these are all people who are based on real characters. Hamsterdam, the experiment of, of legalizing drugs in a certain part of the community. These are real experiments that were tried in Baltimore City. So all David Simon did, he just fictionalized it and changed names. Um, there are a lot of people in Baltimore who have very mixed feelings about it because a lot of people in Baltimore say, you know, that's, it's a terrible impression of our city and, and people think our city is all about drugs and crime and, and corrupt government and all that kind of stuff and people need to have a better impression of it. I, I don't disagree with them that it wasn't, didn't shine Baltimore in the best of lights. Um, but I think that a lot of people in Baltimore who think that way, and maybe I'm in the, I, I know I'm in the distinct minority, are being pretty short-sighted about this. Because actually, I think instead of continuing to run away from the impression of the wire, I actually think Baltimore needs to embrace it. We are an American city that has challenges just like any other American city. We know where our baseline is, we know where our benchmarks are. Instead of running away from this, and in many cases running away from our own historical past, why not build upon it? The fact that I'm sitting here in Cambridge talking about the wire, <laughs> talking about Baltimore means there is an international fascination about this city. Two years ago, the number one show, how you, US dramas, the number one show in London, US show, was The Wire. There's an international fascination about this city that I think we have to do a better job of embracing. And I'm not being disrespectful to anyone who's from these cities, but there's no international fascination about Cincinnati. <laughs> there's no international fascination about, about San Jose or about whatever. I mean, it's something that I think we have to do a better job of embracing and saying, you know what, we know who we are, we know who we're not, but we also know who we can be. Use that as a way of being able to build out not just a sense of curiosity, but quite honestly, a sense of collective involvement about how exactly do we build up these institutions that we once called great American cities. That Baltimore doesn't have to be a, historically, a, a historical rust belt but that there's real opportunities to do things that are really interesting and innovative and inspiring inside of our city. So I think The Wire is great. It's not just great television. It doesn't just expose real truth and honesty. And quite honestly, for those, if you're, not even if you're interested in Baltimore, if you're just interested in, in the fascinating workings of municipal policy and municipal government, check out The Wire. It is a fascinating, fascinating show. And again, talking about you know, what we were talking about earlier about the dynamics of, of what's rational to kids. Check out The Wire if you want to understand rationality of decision making for a lot of kids who get involved in things like drugs and crime, et cetera. Because The Wire does a brilliant job of breaking that down and why this becomes incredibly rational to them. So I think it's great. I just wish we would do a better job of being a little bit more long-sighted about how exactly, how important The Baltimore, how important The Wire can be not just to our present, but in, more importantly to our future. Thank you so much. Thank you.